So let's start talking about the situation of Trump, who has been again indicted. At this point, it's prosecutorial harassment coordinated across the whole of the United States. And look at how the leftist media is happy. Uh, CNN with their big title. When they pull these big titles on the front page, you know they're not. Uh, they're super happy. Trump pleads not guilty to January 6 charges. We will review the whole of the indictment. Uh, we have seen today that Trump was arraigned. His arraignment hearing has concluded. He concluded by pleading not guilty. We will have a full review of uh, the indictment to see that it's insufficient, basically. Insufficient, in my view, to seriously prove that Trump is engaged in a lie, in a knowing lie, about the election. What it looks to me is that all of the actions that are reported in this indictment uh, could be explained very easily by simply invoking the possibility that Trump, in his mind, truly believes that the election was stolen. And if you truly believe that the election was stolen, you're going to take the means to, uh, to legally rectify the situation. It is not a crime to legally try to rectify a situation that you truly believe is fraudulent. Uh, Mikhail has sent a super chat. He said, regarding Europeans, can you tell from what part of Europe they come uh, exclusively by looking at their phenotype? Well, there are certain things that you can recognize that will differentiate definitely Eastern Europe from a Western European. Um, will you get to the point of being 100% accurate on distinguishing between a French and an English, between a French and, and someone from Switzerland? Maybe not. Uh, maybe not. But you have, certain de you have a certain degree of resolution that, yes, it's possible. Definitely, if you show me 10 different uh, East Europeans uh, and than 10 French people, I will be able to classify most of them properly. So before we get to the review of the indictment, let's listen to what Trump had to say when he came out of the indictment hearing. Thank you very much. This is a very sad day for America. And it was also very sad driving through Washington, D.C. and seeing the filth and the decay and all of the broken buildings and walls and the graffiti. This is not the place that I left. It's a very sad thing to see it. Uh, when you look at what's happening, this is a persecution of a political opponent. This was never supposed to happen in America. This is the persecution of the person that's leading by very, very substantial numbers in the Republican primary and leading Biden by a lot. So if you can't beat him, you persecute him or you prosecute him. We can't let this happen in America. Thank you very you much, everyone. All right. Absolutely uh, correct. And I was looking at some of the videos coming out of this arraignment hearing. And holy shit, is Washington, D.C. not doing good? Look at the filth and the protesters with their dirty flags and... It's really a circus. Look at this. I mean, there are some guy like this that are, that are Trump supporters. But l l let's go through the video, and I want you to to pay attention to the protesters, the homeless people, all mixed in. I see Donald Trump go up in the poll four points. I expect to see Ron DeSantis lose two points because that's what's happened at every in uh, indictment. Because I've been to every indictment. <laughs> Look at the bunch of bizarre people celebrating the indictment of Trump. Those are the kind of people who rejoice in the destruction of someone else by legal uh, persecution means. <laughs> Uh, 
And that was a guy dressed uh, as a prisoner to to kind of represent the state of Trump as he will be imprisoned and, and to celebrate that fact that he will be imprisoned. This is the coalition of the bizarre that is uh, that is celebrating the suffering of another human being, celebrating the harassment of another human being. All right, so what do we have to prove in this indictment for it to make any sense? Uh, count one, conspiracy to defraud the United States. Count two, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. Count three, obstruction of an attempt to obstruct an official proceeding. And count four, conspiracy against rights. So for any of these things, I have to have a... I have to have evidence from Trump's mouth himself that he knew that election fraud doesn't exist, that he was actively lying, and that therefore he was pursuing uh, a true obstruction of an official proceeding, not merely trying to perfect an official proceeding. Because whenever you have a legal path, uh, done by the government, whenever you have a process, a proceeding, you're going to have some differences in the employees of the government, the president. Various people will think in various ways about what needs to be done for this to be properly run. The election is the same. How to properly run an election and what needs to be done if it's not been properly run, there will be various beliefs. Some will want to do A, some will want to do B, some will want to do C. It's not a crime to believe that C is the right way to uh, do that process, even if you're proven wrong later by the standard of other experts. Even if there are liars who tell you, no, that C is not good, you should do A. Sometimes there are options. Sometimes there are different ways to handle a, an official proceeding. And for me to, to have a belief that this indictment suffices for any of these four counts, I would have to have a clear evidence that Trump believed inside of him, that he, he truly believed that elec the election wasn't stolen, but that he would still say it uh, to the people and deceive the people toward believing that. Mark D's channel says, how dare he try to obstruct the biggest electoral fraud in history? John Drake says, constitutional liar Alan Dershowitz says, the supreme pizzas will overturn any conviction in about two seconds. Okay, so you believe that Trump would eventually be saved by the Supreme Court? I also think it's a very likely outcome. If the jury is too uh, militant, too activist, uh, I think it wouldn't be surprising to see a Supreme Court that comes in and says, for some technical issue that they find, they will say, all right, we're throwing that verdict out of the window. <clears throat> so let's see what uh, Trump is supposed to have committed. The, tr the defendant's conspiracy to impair, obstruct, and defeat the federal government function, so, so the federal government function is the election, through dishonesty, fraud, and deceit, including the included the following manner and means. So if you want to say fraud, deceit, and dishonesty, you need to show that Trump knew it was false. The defendant and co-conspirators use knowingly false claims of election fraud to get state legislators and election officials to subvert the legitimate election results and change electoral votes. So the problem with this accusation is knowingly false. How did Trump know it was false? Someone may have told him it was false. Is he forced to believe that someone? If I have two people coming to me and they say, Jeff, uh, the lady in the blue dress committed the murder, 
And someone else says, Jeff, the, that's false. The lady in the blue dress did not commit the murder. And I decide that one is more persuasive than the other. I have the right to develop my own belief that, yes, the lady in the blue dress committed the murder. Am I being fraudulent because I decide to believe person A rather than believe person B? Perhaps person B didn't make the best case. Perhaps they were poorly dressed and they were not inspiring confidence in the way they were dressed. And so I decided to, to believe the guy who was better dressed. When you are confronted with a choice about what to believe, uh, one cannot argue that you've been informed of the truth and therefore that anything that you hold against that truth becomes knowing lies. And knowing lies, I would need evidence that Trump knew, believed in his heart that the election fraud didn't happen. So they talk about the... Uh, the organizing of fraudulent slate of electors, uh, attempting to mimic the procedures that the legitimate electors were supposed to follow under the Constitution and other federal and state laws. This included causing the fraudulent electors to meet on the day appointed by, the feder by federal law on which legitimate electors... Again, this is all your assumptions. Fraudulent electors legitimate electors, all of this is your view of the world. Perhaps in Trump's view of the world, and I suspect this is what he will hold uh, in the witness booth, in his view of the world, uh, they were not legitimate electors because they were fed fraudulent data by the people who counted those votes. So the legitimate electors were those who were, uh, who were willing to sign to sign off on the fact that election fraud had been committed. They attempted to use the power and authority of the Justice Department to conduct sham election crime investigations. Again, the problem is in the characterization here. Sham election crime investigations. There is no point at which Trump ordered the DOJ, hey, please do a sham investigation for me. So what's making it a sham? Perhaps Trump wanted them to conduct a legitimate investigation. What is the sh where does the sham come from here? It comes from your interpretation as a prosecutor. It's your belief. It has nothing to do with Trump's belief. And therefore, it doesn't qualify as evidence. This should be totally barred. This is all interpretative discussion of, uh, of not what Trump truly believes, but of what... The prosecutor believes the targeted state's legislature to convene to create the opportunity to choose the fraudulent electors over the legitimate electors. So that was back in the days when Trump was trying to convince the representatives in Congress, uh, the representatives in the state house and state senate, and he was trying to convince them that some fraud had been occurring and therefore it was their responsibility to dismiss the official results and to include the real results. Again, this is very well explainable by Trump truly believing that uh, there was election fraud. If, there, if you knew there was election fraud, wouldn't you call your politicians and say, hey, can you do something about it? Hey, can you pass a law to catch these fraudsters because it's happening. That is what Trump has done. It's totally legal to pressure officials of the government to pursue justice in a case where you perceive justice has not been pursued. First, using knowingly false claims of election fraud, the defendant attempted to convince the vice president to use the defendant's fraudulent electors. Again, you have no grounds for knowingly false. You have zero ground to say that Trump knew they were false claims. The only grounds that will be later presented in the document is that some liars were telling Trump, hey, that's false. Well, Trump has the choice to believe them or not, but he's not making a knowingly false statement unless you can prove to me that he knew it was false. 
And one person coming to him and saying, hey, that's false, is not sufficient. Sometimes you can be convinced by stronger evidence for the other side, even if you have contradictory claims being made by experts. Uh, then there is the gathering of supporters, falsely told them that the vice president had the authority to and might alter the election results and directed them to the Capitol to obstruct the certification proceeding. So this whole statement is easily explainable by Trump truly believing that, that Vice President Pence had this power. And it was an area of legal controversy. You can believe one side or the other. You can believe John Eastman and his theory that it is fair for a vice president to do this, or you can believe someone else, some of the experts that are on CNN. But it's not because you decide on either of these beliefs that you are denying the other side or that you are engaged in falsely representing views. Perhaps it's your true view, and it is definitely Trump's true view, that Vice President Pence could have intervened. And then they claim uh, that the crowd was motivated by these fraudulent claims uh, to basically go commit violence, which delayed the certification of the vote. But on that point, I would say, did Trump order them to obstruct the proceeding or Trump ordered them to be peaceful, to go protest? Well, he ordered them to go protest, totally in line with the peaceful uh, guarantees of the First Amendment. He told them, go there and protest. Now, the fact that some of them decided to commit violence doesn't make uh, Trump part of a crime or part of a knowing... Uh, obstruction. So they claim these claims were false and the defendant knew that they were false, but they have nothing. They have nothing on this point. What I need is a recording of Trump that's like, oh yeah, we're going to lie. Or yeah, I know that it's false, but I'm still going to say it. I have nothing like this. In fact, the defendant was notified repeatedly that his claims were untrue often by the people on whom he relied for candid advice on important matters and who were best positioned to know the facts, and he deliberately disregarded the truth. And this is what's important about this whole prosecution. It is a prosecution of expert binding. It's a prosecution that rests on the wrongful assumption that if any expert tells you something, it's the truth. And if you don't believe it, then you're a liar because you now know the truth. But that is not how, uh, how a fair process should be had for Trump. A fair process for Trump would be to say, are you forced to believe an expert? Is it because one expert told you, oh, that, that's false, that it, it becomes false in your mind? Or is there a possibility, is there a liberty elbow for everyone, for every individual in America to decide well, that is the view of the experts, but my view differs? Because this whole prosecution rests on the fact that, oh, well, there were experts that told him, even experts that he had hired. Doesn't change anything. Someone can decide to totally ignore Ignore a bunch of experts and prefer another bunch of experts. You are not bound by the opinion of experts. Mark D's channel says, I'm an expert about experts. Most experts lie when it's convenient. <laughs> well, you have, uh, you have uh, brought some great expertise here, Mark D's channel, but I don't believe you. I think you're bullshitting me. I don't believe experts, and you're an expert about experts. The senior leader of the Justice Department, appointed by the defendant and responsible for investigating credible allegations of election crimes, 
told the defendant on multiple occasions that various allegations of fraud were unsupported. Again, uh, I don't, I am not bound to trust these people. I may trust other people. I may trust my own acquisition of data through other means. I may trust alternative media that I'm watching if I'm Trump. The director of national intelligence told Trump that uh, it wouldn't change the outcome of the election. Again, I am not bound to the conclusions of the director of national intelligence. If I have a media that shows me videos of the fraud, it shows me how there were, let, let's say how let, you take the Project Veritas uh, investigation on the election, clearly convince me that there is vote harvesting that's happening illegally in the US. I have this, I have it on video, I have the person doing the vote, at, at the vote harvesting for cash and doing it in an illegal way and explaining that the person knows it's illegal and still doing it. That is more solid evidence than a director of national intelligence coming to me and saying, no, we have, uh, we have looked into uh, all cases of fraud, and believe me, just trust me. Uh, it's not enough to explain a difference in the outcome of the election. What do you know about it? How can you quantify how many of the fraudulent votes have gone through the very person and people like them that I saw on Project Veritas? What is your scientific method to know how much of that type of fraud happens. You don't know. No one knows. No one knows. All we can know is, well, the Project Veritas made a beautiful video that's absolutely convincing that some amount of fraud is happening. Trump can very well decide, I'm going to trust the Project Veritas report. I'm going to try to extrapolate it in my mind, knowing just how much money George Soros and the likes are throwing into these dark networks of vote harvesting. And I'm going to believe that it's possible that the election outcome was affected by this mechanism, rather than believe this director of national intelligence who doesn't have the scientific method to affirm his own conclusion. So if I'm Trump, that's what I believe. That, therefore, I'm not knowingly lying to the, to the public or to the official agents. I'm just believing different from you. The Department of Homeland Security, Cyber Security, and Infrastructure Security Agency told Trump the same thing. Well, again, Trump is not bound to listen to the Homeland Security, the senior White House attorneys, the senior staffers of the re-election campaign, the state legislators on an official, and the state and federal courts. This is the fundamental problem of this lawsuit. It's not because a bunch of people tell you something that you have to believe it. That, that is the uh, non sequitur that they're doing in this lawsuit. Well, you got told by all these experts that it was false. That is still not a demonstration that within Trump's art, it was false. In fact, nothing points to this. Everything points to Trump truly believing what he's been saying for years. The defendant incinerated that more than 10,000 dead voters had voted in Georgia. And here, again, the, the, the problem is, you have to believe that the defendant acting attorney general and acting deputy attorney general had explained to him that this was false is he bound is he bound to believe the attorney general on this or can he believe other reports can he make his own mind about this dude says wow papa jeff read my first free chat please I read it, but your first free chat was said before this, and it said, imagine if Trump was guaranteed pre-2005, it changes a lot. 
Well, I'm gonna let you off the hook because it's your first free chat. But I, you have to learn to express yourself better, bro. It's not even clear what you mean. If Trump was pre-2005 guaranteed, guaranteed pre-2005, is there anyone in the chat who understands what this crazy person means? Because I'm about to sue him for conspiracy to lie to JF. I think he knowingly is making chats that don't make sense to just fuck my brain up. Dilogovic says, be brutal, JF. This isn't kindergarten. Uh, I'm contacting my lawyers right now. He is knowingly trying to confuse me. The defendant claimed that there had been tens of thousands of double votes in an other fraud in Nevada. But the Nevada Secretary of State had previously rebuted the defendant's fraud claims by publicly posting a fax versus Smith document explaining that Nevada judges had reviewed and rejected them. Again, you are not bound to follow the legal opinion of courts and judges. It's not because a judge decides something or a secretary of state publishes a little pamphlet that it becomes the truth. It certainly doesn't become the truth in Trump's heart. And so no demonstration here, totally insufficient. The Speaker of the Arizona House of Representatives, who had supported the defendant in the election, had issued a public statement that there was no evidence of substantial fraud in Arizona. Well, again, and now they're trying to say, okay, maybe these experts Trump didn't believe because they were not his friend, but... This guy, this guy is a Republican, and he was saying there was no fraud. Trump is not bound to believe what another Republican believes. Trump is not bound to believe someone because he was previously a friend to him. You are no more bound to the opinion of experts than you are bound to the opinion of your friends. What the fuck, like, what kind of mindset do you need to be in to come up with a prosecution like this? You have to be in the mindset that of state-determined truth, basically. No matter what the judge says, you may be shut down in the, the, the judicial proceeding. The judge may decide that what you say is false, or, and the judge may say, you can't say this anymore in this proceeding. But when you get out of a court process or a Supreme Court uh, airing, you are totally free to believe that everything the judge said is bullshit. And that is not to lie. That is not to divert from the truth. It is to develop your own truth. You have the freedom to differ from the state's conclusion on anything in this country. The defendant's attorney general, acting attorney general, and acting deputy attorney general all had explained to him that this was false and numerous recounts and audits had confirmed the accuracy of voting machines. You are not bound to attorney generals and what they believe. You are the president of the United States. You have absolute authority over everything that you believe. And it's not because there is an audit that's been happening that you have to be convinced by the audits. There are serious questions about whether audits are sufficient at all, whether they could detect the kind of fraud we're talking about. Because the kind of fraud we're thinking is pre-machine uh, pre fraud of the kind that would actually insert the false vote in the machine, so that if you recount them in a month, you're going to get the same count, but you're counting fraudulent votes. Uh, the kind of fraud we're talking about is the, the illegal funding of vote harvesting operations and mail-in voting operations that are illegal. Again, you can recount them. They're still illegal, but, but you're, you're going to include the illegal ones in your count. So you don't have to be satisfied by an audit. An audit is not binding on every individual's 
so that they are forced to believe in it. Uh, so at some point, Trump demands evidence to one of his uh, one of his aides. The aide doesn't come back with evidence. Uh, eventually, the Arizona House Speaker refuses to do what Trump uh, requests, stating that doing so would require a two-thirds vote of its members, and he would not allow it without actual evidence of fraud. Well, okay, that's Trump trying to convince a politician to do something, and the politician saying, I can't do this. That is very far from any sort of conspiracy to commit a crime. For evidence, and that is one of the standards that is omnipresent in this lawsuit, evidence of the outcome determinative election fraud. They always use this phrasing. But outcome determinative election fraud is like asking for something that may never be attained. In the sense that you can prove that this guy committed fraud. You can prove that this girl was doing vote harvesting. You can prove with the Project Veritas method of hidden cameras. Okay, this girl has done about 1,000 vote harvest, and therefore she has had that impact on the election. But most of the time, you're never going to get to the full count. You're never going to prove that there are 200,000 cases of individual votes that have been fraudulent. And yet, that is the standard that you would use in a, in a lawsuit to contest an election. But that is not the standard for which th that applies to the belief of Trump in his heart. Trump in his heart can very well say, I've seen enough. I've seen one case of fraud. It convinces me that the system is fraudulent and I reject the outcome of the election. You can develop that belief even if that belief wouldn't be enough to win a lawsuit in uh, an election contest, that may be enough with your rationality, with Trump's interpretation of these facts, to say, all right, <clears throat> I've seen five cases of fraud on video, well-captured, well-documented. I believe there must be a million others that we failed at documenting. That could be Trump's legitimate belief which would make this whole lawsuit fall. Because if Trump is legitimately believing that there's been election fraud, then all of his, all of his actions are explained. So they call the Arizona White House Speaker to urge him to use a majority of the legislature to decertify the state's legitimate electors, Arizona's validly ascertained electors. You can totally ask a politician, could you vote for this? I mean, I, I could literally ask for a politician, could you, uh, could you vote against the uh, murder laws? And I wouldn't have committed a conspiracy to uh, circumvent murder laws. I would have made pressure, as it is described in the First Amendment, I would have made a request by voice to the government. I would have expressed a concern to the government. I want to change murder laws. I think that murder laws are too severe. Am I committing a conspiracy for murder right now? No. <clears throat> I'm trying to change the state of law because I perceive that there's something wrong about it. Well, that's exactly what Trump was doing there. Trying to pressure legislators into directing the law in one direction rather than another. Uh, so at some point, he gets a message from his aide. Just for your information, a campaign lawyer and his team verified that the 10K plus supposed dead people voting in Georgia is not accurate. It was alleged in co-conspirators one's hearing today. So Trump is faced with different people telling him different thing. One is saying, oh yeah, there's 10,000 dead people who voted. Another is saying, oh yeah, we checked that claim, it's false. <clears throat> Trump is free to believe whoever he wants. It's not because he's been informed by some liar that they believe it's false. 
that he has to adhere to that belief. Experts don't own Trump's brain. And that's, that's ultimately what the leftists are taking issue with. The defendant issued a tweet amplifying the knowingly false claims. Well, again, if Trump tweets about it, it just means that he's not been convinced by his lawyer. He's not been convinced by lawyer two. He preferred the explanation of lawyer one. That is not Trump lying. That is Trump having made a choice on his belief. <clears throat> uh, one, at one point, one of his aides complains and he says, when our research and campaign legal team can't back up any of the claims made by our elite strike force legal team, you can see why we're 032 on our cases. I'll obviously hustle to help on all fronts. But it's tough to own any of this when it's all just conspiracy shit beamed down from the mothership. So someone on Trump's team was convinced that it was bullshit, that Trump's theories and his facts were not reliable. That doesn't bind Trump. That may be the opinion of this guy, that it was conspiratorial bullshit. Trump may have believed something else. <clears throat> Co-conspirator pled the State Farm Arena video and falsely claimed that it showed voter fraud right in front of people's eyes and was the tip of the iceberg, quite obviously sur surreptitiously passing around USB ports as if they are vials of heroin or cocaine. I remember that video. I mean, it was a worrying video where clearly you see an election worker going to the table of another election worker, and they're like, they give a USB key. And it's very clear that they felt they were handling something secret here. Now, you can take it as you wish. You can say that's not evidence of election fraud. That was the belief of some of the officials. They said, oh yeah, we looked at this video and it's benign. But that's your belief as an official. Trump can look at this video and say, wow, th that's worrying. I mean, why so sneaky? Why so sneaky? And Trump is free to reach his own conclusion about this video. Been made aware that some of the allegations and evidence proffered by the experts has been inaccurate and that signing a new affirmation with that knowledge and incorporation by reference would not be accurate. So here they are, they are preparing to file a document in court. That may be the only place in this lawsuit where if they can prove that, maybe, maybe Trump did something illegal. So what they claim is they were about to submit a paper in court and a co-conspirator, maybe a liar, comes in and says, oh yeah, I've had new knowledge and what we're about to submit in court, that statement here, that would be false. And so if we update this document, we would be forced to indicate that it's false. So are you sure you want to update this document? Perhaps we're just better filing it the way it is. That way we can argue that it was written before. If there was such a discussion in which basically Trump was agreeing to file something that he knew was false and sign something that he knew was false, uh, that could be a, a form of perjury. That could be a form of lying to the, to the court. But Trump is not being sued for perjury. So, see, bizarrely, the only case that I find to cross the threshold of potential sufficiency that is not a count uh, that is not a count that is being sued for. So while this may suffice to say oh, something dirty happened with Trump's signature here, that would not be a conspiracy to uh, to obstruct rights. It would be a at best, a conspiracy for perjury. Um, I, I, I think that Trump will come up with an explanation that makes sense against this and that 
it's very possible that the prosecution will fail to demonstrate. Because it's a, it's a strong claim, this idea that Trump would have been in a discussion in which they say, oh yeah, that's a lie. And Trump would somewhat maybe, uh, maybe uh, implicitly agreeing to publish that lie or file that lie in court. Not sure what they're, go- what they're going to do with this, but let's point out that this is just the document of the prosecution. We haven't heard a word from Trump yet. It's very easy for a defendant to come in and explain away a lot of the things that may seem bizarre in the initial interpretation of a prosecutor. Uh, And the Georgia Secretary of State's counsel explained to him that the claim had been investigated and was not true. Trump isn't bound by the Georgia Secretary of State's conclusion. Uh, Same thing here. It's all the Georgia Secretary of State telling him. uh, Here they claim that Trump has made some sort of, of threat. So Trump calls the Georgia Secretary of State. And he says, and you are going to find that they are, which is totally illegal. It's, it's more illegal for you than it is for them, because you know what? They did, and you're not reporting it. That's a criminal. You know, that's, that's a criminal offense. And you know, you can't let that happen. That's a big risk to you and to the Georgia Secretary of State's counsel. You're a liar. So Trump here is reminding the Georgia Secretary of State don't don't turn a blind eye to fraud because don't forget that if you do you are committing a crime i don't think it's going to qualify as a conspiracy to uh to obstruct rights at best if you had a case of extortion i would say this perhaps could meet the standard for extortion but again it's not in the count trump is not being sued for perjury not being sued for extortion. So this on its own, it may qualify. If you can make a case that Trump was in the mindset of forcing the Georgia Secretary of State to do something wrong, maybe you would have a case for extortion, but not a case for conspiracy against rights. Was unwilling or unable to answer questions such as the ballots under the table. He has no clue. So that's Trump concluding after his discussion with the Georgia Secretary of State. Basically, I am not satisfied with what he's told me. I still believe there was election fraud. So there you go. You have the Trump mindset. Uh, They do the same with the Michigan uh, case. Michigan House Speaker making this statement that there was no election fraud. Well, what if Trump decided to not believe him? Again, they use the term knowingly false statement when they have no evidence that Trump knew. They have plenty of evidence that people told Trump that it was false. They have no evidence that Trump was convinced that it was false. Looks like Georgia may well hold some factual hearings and change the certification under Article 2, blah, 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 As they explained, they just don't have the right to do it, but the obligation helped me get this done in Michigan. So that is an aide of, uh, that is a collaborator of Trump trying to explain to a, uh, to the legislature, to the House Speaker, hey, we have this plan to have alternate electors that will contest the legitimacy of the regular electors. We need your help. Can you do something uh, at the legal level? I think you have a responsibility to do it. That's people invoking legal responsibilities. This is not the language of criminals. This is the language of people truly convinced that they are enacting the will of the U.S. Constitution. It's all similar things. Philadelphia City Commissioner receives death threats. Again, if I'm critical of the Philadelphia City Commissioner and someone else that I don't know sends death threat to him, am I responsible? Have I just sent death threats? No, I didn't. 
I have contested something that is done publicly. If someone else sends death threat, that is not my responsibility. That's the situation Trump finds himself with. Each time the Justice Department officials inform the defendant that his claim was false. He is not forced to believe the Justice Department officials. It is all this over and over again. <clears throat> they then talk about the plan to have fake electors. Uh, they describe a memo by uh, probably, I think that this person is John Eastman, although he's not named, uh, saying, we have our electors sending their votes, even though the votes aren't legal under federal law because they're not signed by the governor, just so that members of Congress can fight about whether they should be counted on January 6th. They could potentially argue that they're not bound by federal law because they're Congress and make the law, etc. Kind of wild slash creative. I'm happy to discuss. My comment to him was that I guess there's no harm in it, legally at least, i.e. we would just be sending in fake electoral votes to Pence so that someone in Congress can make an objection when they start counting votes and start arguing that the fake votes should be counted. So that is an aide of Trump that is not Trump, who used in a very, uh, let's say, informal setting, used the word fake to describe the alternative electors. First, it's not Trump, so it doesn't tell me anything about the state of belief of Trump. It tells me that this guy in the team of Trump was referring to this slate of electors as fake. And he was saying fake in quotation marks. So that's not fake. If, if you truly believe they are fake, you wouldn't put quotation mark. So even that guy, it's not clear that he believes they're fake. But certainly none of this shows that Trump believes they are fake. At some point, someone in the team, maybe John Eastman, Eastman uh, says to Trump, it could appear treasonous, well, it says to actually not Trump, but uh, co-conspirator one, which is probably uh, Giuliani, it could appear treasonous for the AZ electors to vote on Monday if there is no pending court proceedings. And they suggest this is evidence that they knew what they were doing was treason. Uh, appear treasonous is not the same as treasonous, first. Second, this is a discussion that Trump is not in. It's a discussion between potentially John Eastman and Giuliani. That doesn't involve Trump. So no proof of the state of mind of Trump. Deputy campaign manager responded at some point, here's the thing, that, this, that the way this has morphed, it's a crazy play. So I don't know who wants to put their name on it. Certifying illegal votes. In turn, the participants in the group text message refused to have a statement regarding electors attributed to their names because none of them could stand by it. Okay, so you have someone in the Trump team having doubts about the plan. You have a bunch of electors who are, who are fagging away, as we say in the pimp business. None of this shows me that Trump believed the same, that Trump believed this plan was not sound. And here they interpret that they filed a lawsuit in New Mexico six minutes before the noon deadline for the electors' vote as a pretext so that there was pending lit litigation. You are interpreting it as a pretext. Maybe Trump was motivated by very noble desires of doing justice with this lawsuit. You say it's a pretext. Do I have evidence that Trump believed it was a pretext? No. <clears throat> uh, Trump is being uh, passed on some information, okay. Uh, they discussed the plan of Trump to replace the acting deputy attorney general to place someone in position that could help him. 
and he asks the attorney general, just say that the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. That doesn't sound like a conspiracy to commit a crime here. Uh, that sounds like Trump is saying, just say your opinion that it is corrupt in general, the election process, and the rest is a political fight. We'll handle it in Congress. We'll have some Republican House representatives will contest the validity of the vote. But I want you to just say your opinion publicly. Uh, that makes total sense. Now, whether it was the, the actual opinion of the Attorney General is challenged, but, that, but the fact that Trump invites him to express this as his opinion is not a fraud, it's not a lie, it's not an obstruction. It's just Trump's encouraging him to say that the election was defrauded. But then it turns out, well, the acting deputy attorney general does not believe this. So he refuses to publish the, the statement. That's okay. I can ask you, hey, Dino Legovich, uh, could, you, uh, could you say on the regular chat right now that prostitution is okay? And then you could come back to me and say, Jeff, I, I don't believe that prostitution is okay. I think prostitution is bad. Did I force you? Did I obstruct you? Did I do anything wrong to you? No, I didn't. I invited you to express something and you correct me. You say, Jeff, that's not what I believe. That's what happened in the Trump discussion here. Nothing illegal. Uh, they discuss at some point, well, if, if Trump... There is no world, there is no option in which you do not leave the White House on January 20th. That is one of his cucked liars saying that to Trump, the White House counsel. Uh, because he says, you know, if you stay in the White House on January 20th, there will be riots on the streets. And uh, a friend of Trump says, well, that's why there's an insurrection act. <laughs> Uh, th this doesn't involve Trump at all, so it's not valid evidence for this trial. But it's funny to see that, you know, someone was like in the White House, there's going to be riots everywhere. And someone says, well, we have the Insurrection Act. We, we can squash this revolution. <laughs> I love how chill this guy was. Uh, eventually, Trump gives up on his uh, plan to replace the attorney general because he's told, you know, all of the higher ups of the uh, Department of Justice, they will all mass resign, you know, to show their ideological resistance to your decision. So at some point he comes on January 3, I believe. And he says, yeah, it's getting pretty late to, uh, you know, to do all of this legal process. What we're going to do is we're going to try to keep it going but we're going to leave this to the next guy in the sense that, okay, well, we're getting very close to January 6th, January 20. Now they interpret this as see Trump knew that it was over. Well, no, that's Trump resigning on the, the face of the legal complexities and admitting that at this point, we're getting way too close to the date to have impacts through investigation of specific case frauds. And so that's at this point, Trump's strategy reverts to let's have public pressure. Let's have people protesting at the, at the, the Capitol. And it makes total sense from a totally legal interpretation that Trump sends his fans to the Capitol to make a peaceful statement to the, to the legislature. A peaceful statement that says we are not satisfied that the election was fair. So in conclusion, and that's it. I mean, show me all of the violence of January 6th. That's what they do at the end of the, at the, end of the, the prosecution. This doesn't concern Trump. In fact, there is a very dishonest interpretation made of a Trump statement at the end, which tells me this, this prosecutor is lying. This prosecutor is intentionally misinterpreting 
stuff that cannot be interpreted in the way he does or she does. I don't know. Because look at this. This is the prosecutor's interpretation of Trump's statement. Instead, the defendant issued two tweets that did not ask rioters to leave the Capitol, but instead falsely suggested that the crowd at the Capitol was being peaceful, including... And so, so let, let's cut it out here. I don't want to show you the Trump statement, but what are the two elements that the prosecutor suggests is in those statements? He says, those statements, Trump is not asking the rioters to leave the Capitol, and Trump is falsely suggesting that the crowd at the Capitol is peaceful. Now, let's look at the statement. Are these two elements ticked off? So that's the first Trump tweet. Please support our Capitol Police and law enforcement. They are truly on the side of our country. Stay peaceful. That is Trump telling to his base. He's not saying, oh, you guys are very peaceful. There is absolutely no violence happening among you guys right now. He's saying, stay peaceful. The, the way I would... I would talk to you and say, oh yeah, when you go out at night, stay peaceful. He's not saying, oh, you are currently being totally peaceful. He's saying, you know, as you, as you engage in that process of protest, please stay peaceful. Now, the, the dishonesty of the interpretation revolves around the word stay here. Uh... The prosecutor is saying, well, stay implies that they were already peaceful and that they just had to continue being peaceful. But stay peaceful is a saying that, that doesn't mean this at all. You can say stay peaceful tonight and the event hasn't even begun. So you're not implying anything about the current state of peacehood. You are just invoking a future state that is desirable of, of peacehood. And the second statement, I am asking for everyone at the U.S. Capitol to remain peaceful. Now, remain, that, that, has, more, that has more of that meaning. Remain, uh, that would mean that they, were, uh, that they were peaceful. But the vast majority, anyway, has always been peaceful. And the people that were at the Capitol, the vast majority were outside the Capitol, just protesting legally. No violence. Remember, we are the party of law and order. Respect the law and our great men and women in blue. Thank you. So here, what the prosecutor is trying to imply to the jury is to say, the fact that he didn't ask them to leave the Capitol is evidence of Trump's desire that they stay in and that therefore they continue blocking the, elector the election process. That is a basically a it, it's a proof by the negative. Oh, you haven't said this, therefore you believe that. Uh, you should you should never be found guilty of a crime for not doing something. The only exception to this being neglect and, and reckless conduct. But you should not be found guilty of a conspiracy because you failed at doing something. Basically, what the prosecutor is implying is these statements were not strong enough. They were so not strong enough that we are convinced that deep inside, Trump wanted the, the democratic process to be physically and violently blocked. And that's why he made these invoc invocation of staying peaceful, but he didn't do them strong enough because he didn't tell them to get out of the Capitol. Well, at this point, Trump can very well answer, I didn't know that there was such a crowd inside the Capitol that it was keeping the process from continuing. He can, he can, uh, he can claim, well, I knew there were people inside, but I didn't think that my appealing to them would make them get out.
So if there were people inside, they needed to get to be gotten out by the police of the capital, by the army. But I didn't think that my words could influence them. Because if they were inside, it was already against my orders and my counseling. Because as I was in the in the public discourse, I had said on the public stage, I had said, don't go inside, just go uh, peacefully protest. And so I didn't have an impact on these rioters. Trump can very well explain all of this away, just like the rest of the... <clears throat> of the case. And so it's a very weak prosecution. I hope that Trump will win it in in a quick manner, but it's legal harassment and it's all meant to create an aura of doubt around Trump.